scene. Kid me at my friend's house in the year 2001. Alex was playing on his Nintendo 64 and was forcing me to watch him play Banjo-Kazooie. The jerk. Fortunately for me, he had some gaming magazines scattered across his room, so I decided to peruse through them. I flipped through a few pages and lo and behold, I saw a promo illustration that would stick with me for the rest of my life. Flower boobies. Oh, what a thing to behold. What game does this beauty come from? Conker's Bad Fur Day. Wait, Conker? Wasn't he that cutesy squirrel from Diddy Kong Racing? Why is he here? I thought he was a good boy. I guess I was wrong. From that point on, I was on a mission. Now fast forward a few months later, where I'm walking with my dad at the local blockbuster. I grab the game and bring it with me to the checkout counter. Dad is none the wiser. That or he's just based. But then the Blockbuster employee opened his dumb mouth. Sir, this game is rated M for mature, and your son is about only, what, 12 years old? You should probably get him something else. My world was shattered, and my father buckled under the pressure. I had to take the game back and get something else, which was probably battle tanks or something. For the rest of my life, I would regret that moment and vowed to play this game when I was old enough or was able to get my hands on it. But time has a way of making us forget about our vows. That and I'm pretty forgetful and dumb, but now I can pursue this dream. Now I can play the game via Rare Replay on the Xbox. Now I can finally see the plant boobies. Oh. I just hope that this thing lives up to the hype. Well, I guess Conker's just another addition to the letdown pile. In you go. <laughs> now that's what I call a bowel movement. For those who don't know, Conker's Bad Fur Day is a 3D platformer that was originally released on the Nintendo 64 back in 2001. It was developed by the once great studio Rare, the folks behind iconic hits such as GoldenEye, Banjo-Kazooie, Donkey Kong Country, Perfect Dark, and Sea of Thieves. For Conker's Bad Fur Day, they found themselves in an interesting predicament where they originally intended the game to be kid-friendly. But critics claim that it shared far too similarities to Banjo-Kazooie, which was being developed at the time, and that Conquer, in its original concept, was derivative. So what did Rare do? They took that E rating of Conquer and kicked it all the way up to M. Adult video games, the ones with mature themes like drinking and vulgar language and, of course, sex, uh, were such a bizarre genre of the gaming world around this time, and were definitely more of a novelty. Hell, it's still a bit of an odd subsection of gaming. But nowadays, there are plenty of options available, especially from indie devs. Trust me, I know. But Conker's Bad Fur Day was absolutely unique at the time. To take this cute, cartoony squirrel and dial up his crude humor, drinking, and libido to 100. Oh no, my friends. This isn't a kid's game. This is an adult game. And my god. God, did it suck. Why? Oh, just you wait. I'm about to tell you. Uh, well, yeah, anyway, yeah, I gotta go now. Ugh, you're like the rest of them. I ain't gonna tell you about the big-breasted babe then. The, the, the big what? Uh, thought that might have got your attention. So, what are the origins of Conker's Bad Fur Day? How did this bizarre game even come into being? I mean, it's not every day you get something this rare. Oh, you stupid Look, I already said, the game was developed by Rare, a very prolific game studio during the late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, which is still around to this day, but is somewhat a shadow of its former glorious self. They made Donkey Kong Country, Goldeneye, and of course, its most iconic title, Banjo-Kazooie. For the record, Rare deserves a separate video of its own, and we will eventually get around to that. But for now, we're just going to focus on Conker. Now, Conker, who is an anthropomorphic red squirrel, existed before Conker's Bad Fur Day and made his first debut in Diddy Kong Racing back in 1997. 
He would eventually get his own game in 1999 with the Game Boy release of Conker's Pocket Tales. Now, both of those games featured a kid-friendly version of Conker, and the people at Rare were inspired by Mario 64 and wanted to make their own 3D platform adventure game with Conker being considered heavily as a candidate for it. And also this Anthro Bear as well, which would lead to, of course, Banjo-Kazooie. In 1997, both Conker and Banjo were showcased at E3, with Conker's Quest being the working title. Critics at the time claimed that the game was okay, but somewhat dull, and, quote, makes gamers feel as if they're playing through Disney's movie version of Bambi. In 1998 at E3, the title was changed to 12 Tales, Conquer 64, with critics at that time praising the game's visuals and content, but stating that it was far too similar to Banjo with its kid-friendly tone. For Rare, they took that feedback to heart and decided to overhaul Conquer completely and be the total opposite of a kid-friendly game. Conquer was gonna be for adults. Now, the transition to an adult-oriented game was difficult and took years to accomplish. Team members would argue, devs wouldn't see eye to eye, and there was even a moment where Conquer could have been canceled. But a direction would eventually form with the studio aiming to make an edgy game intended for adults. Chris Seaver, who started working on the Conquer project as a designer, continued to push for a more adult tone for the game which the then-leaders of Rare at the time, Tim and Chris Stamper, both approved of and even made Chris the project director. So Rare was able to salvage what it originally had and was able to pivot Conquer from being a kid-friendly game to an adult-oriented game instead, with plenty of mature humor on top of that. Quite the juxtaposition. To no one's surprise, the game received an M rating and was marketed with that in mind hoping to cash in on the growing 18-plus demographic at the time. Hell, Playboy magazine even teamed up with the marketing campaign for Conquer and featured a marketing tour with Playboy model Miriam Gonzalez. They even had Conquer condoms. Bruh! I want one. Of course, parents would complain about the game, especially the moms who bought the game unsuspectingly and later discovered that they made a very big mistake. Dad, that could have been you and me. Why didn't you let me rent the game? But how did the game sell? Was it successful? Ah, uh, not really. It was released in March of 2001 and only sold around 55,000 copies within the first month of its release. Despite the effort put into salvaging the game and, of course, the uniqueness of it, the game wasn't the commercial success that Rare was hoping for. Ultimately, Conker's Bad Fur Day was a financial failure but it was able to build a cult following which, huh, you know, still lives on to this day. Uh, well, okay. So we know about the bizarre production and reception of Conker's Bad Fur Day, but what was the game about? It is a very story-driven and dialogue-heavy game after all. Well, brace yourselves. This game's plot is all over the place, and I mean that both metaphorically and literally. The story revolves around Conker and how he passed out at a bar, woke up lost in the world the next day, and is now trying to find his way back home. His girlfriend, Barry, was left a voice message the previous evening as Conker said he'd be heading over to her place, but unsurprisingly, never arrived. Instead, he sobers up next to a scarecrow, he helps a king bee get laid with a flower girl, he bounces on the boobs of the flower girl, he meets death and then fights squirrel zombies, he meets a vampire that is his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa. He reenacts the invasion of Normandy. He meets an opera-singing poop monster. He fights in the caveman arena. He faces down a xenomorph. His girlfriend is shot and killed. And it all culminates with the game crashing and Conker requesting a sword from the developers, which he uses to kill the xenomorph. Needless to say, it's a lot. And I'm honestly just scratching the surface when it comes to this chaotic plot, with plenty of fourth wall breaking jokes and pop culture references to match. Hell, they even have a clockwork orange homage at the start, and a very accurate parody of the Saving Private Ryan D-Day landing too. Well, uh, with squirrels instead of allied soldiers. Conker himself is snarky, raunchy, and is even downright cruel. There's a scene where he even sacrifices a baby dinosaur who called him Mommy and deliberately led it to get smashed by a stone slab as an offering. Something that made Conker's Bad Fur Day really stand out were its cutscenes and voice acting. 
which are definitely a main feature of this game. Around this time, cutscenes in video games were still a budding concept, but Conker decided to use its cutscenes and fully utilize its mature rating. Crass jokes, vulgar language, sexual themes, gore, fourth wall breaking jokes. It's genuinely a very big part of the game. So if you don't like cutscenes, you might want to skip Conker's Bad Fur Day. Which, um, by the way, there are much more severe reasons why this game should be skipped, but I'll get to that in a moment. In my opinion, the overall comedic tone, writing, and dialogue for this game are incredibly grating and have not aged well at all. Going into the game, I was giving it the benefit of the doubt, acknowledging that the game itself is over 20 years old, so the writing for it might be a bit rough around the edges, but I was not expecting for the majority of it to be this bad. None of the characters are likable to me. I know that the devs were going for an irreverent and edgy angle with the characters, with an extra helping of absurd humor to match, but the entire experience lacked any cohesion and only frustrated me. I get that the game is trying to embrace cartoony energy with its tone, visuals, and style, with of course mature themes added in as that special ingredient, but it just felt like it was adult humor for the sake of adult humor. Poo poo sex booze fart, am I right, fellow gamers? Now, there are the occasional jokes and exchanges that get me to smile, but they were definitely an exception and not the norm. Now, the audio was impressive for the time, with actual voice actors for the cutscenes. Now, it wasn't good voice acting, but having voices provided at all was already a noteworthy trait of the game, especially for a mature game like this. Though, I gotta say, the voice acting itself was pretty bad. Despite having captions on to read, I still had a hard time understanding some lines. And if I was not reading the captions, I would be lost with what a lot of the characters were trying to say. Yeah, it was that bad. I really appreciate the dynamic change depending on the level. I'm looking at you, poop map. As far as the visuals go, the game looked very good and was one of the best looking games on the N64. It came out in the latter years of the console's lifespan and featured detailed character models both with its gameplay and cutscenes. Poop Monster, Panther King, Giant Cave Woman, they looked very good. Gameplay wise, it's a platformer, which includes puzzles to solve, shooting, hitting, pushing, and of course, jumping. Now this is what I call a platform game. There's also a context-sensitive button that you can press when required to, which will just do a thing to advance the story. Oh no, Conker has a hangover. Press B to sober up. There's also money you can collect, which is the main goal of the game, similar to the stars in Super Mario 64. Now, one of the things Conker does that makes it so much more rough to play through, compared to something like Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie, is that it doesn't commit to a core set of mechanics. Both Mario and Banjo are very character-centric in their gameplay. Both characters have a set of moves that set the tone for what the gameplay is going to be, and how the levels are going to be designed, giving you lots of things to do with those mechanics. Conquer instead tries to be more diverse, which sounds good on paper, but by continually creating new mechanics for each level and then immediately discarding them once you're done, there's no central focus on gameplay that can really be doubled down on and refined. Instead, it just throws tons of half-baked ideas at you, then forgets about them just as fast, which makes the entire experience just as forgettable. On top of that, the controls can be slippery and have definitely aged over the years. You can use Conker's tail to hover for a few seconds, but it's nothing really to write home about. Also, the camera can be very wonky at times and just downright frustrating. Speaking of frustrating, some of the tasks in the game can be very tedious and unforgiving. There's a part of the game called the Spooky Chapter, and there's a point where you have to get these three keys in Dracula's castle. But if you die, not just a game over, but like dying just once, you have to get them all over again and it is incredibly tedious. Also, there's like a soft lock that if you don't open a certain door before getting to the final key, you can't progress forward. So you gotta go die to get out of the soft lock and start getting all three keys all over again. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty terrible. 
pour one out for Paleo here. All in all, Conker's Bad Fur Day did not live up to the hype that I had hoped for, even though I lowered my expectations. Both of my friends played this game along with me, and only Paleo was able to finish it to completion, while both Tom and I had to give up due to how much we weren't enjoying the game. I'm typically a sucker for punishment, and I usually rise to the challenge when it comes to overcoming bad movies and shows. But bad video games are just excruciating, especially when they're unforgiving and difficult to control. Oh, poor kid me. You had no idea the bullet you dodged and saved for future me. Thanks, jerk. Oh, by the way, there was a remake for Conker's Bad Fur Day, and Tom here had the pleasure of suffering this game. Tom, take it away. It's worth mentioning that Conker's Bad Fur Day got a full-on remake treatment from Rare with the help of Microsoft in 2004 in the form of Conker Live and Reloaded. Originally planned as a full-on sequel to the original Bad Fur Day before Rare's acquisition by Microsoft, they instead retooled the project to be a remake of the cult classic, while it also added a hefty new online multiplayer mode to help bait the hook for Xbox Live subscriptions. Live and Reloaded does a lot to improve on the N64 original release. Visually, the game gets a complete makeover, Rare once again flexing their visual prowess, delivering one of the best-looking titles on the original Xbox. Textures are surprisingly sharp and detailed, even compared to the game's contemporaries on the console, while also making liberal use of bump and normal maps to give assets an extra level of depth. Conker and the other animal characters have fully rendered fur, instead of just faking it with a texture, standard practice for basically every other game at that point, and something that no other console outside the Xbox would have had the horsepower to facilitate while keeping the frame rate acceptable. Which is another improvement over the N64 version as well. Like most N64 games, the original Conker frequently suffered from massive frame drops, reducing the experience to barely more than a slideshow. Live and Reloaded gives a vastly better realized visual experience while also keeping the game running at a brisk 30 frames per second, the common target for consoles at the time. Probably the only visual aspect not vastly smoothed over is the character animation. The original Conker was a technical showstopper for the N64, considering how late in its life cycle that game was released, but its animation doesn't really hold up all that well. Few games from that era do, as it was before motion capture animation really became technically feasible, and even hand animating was tricky because the hardware simply couldn't support the whole host of joints characters would need to move in a fully lifelike manner. The Xbox, by contrast, was fully capable of such, and many games took advantage of this. Live and Reloaded seems to be using the animation data from the original game, or is intentionally replicating it nearly verbatim, and as a result the characters move with far less grace than what was expected of other games of that era. The entire library of mascot platformers made for the PlayStation 2 and even other Xbox mascot games like Blinks had better animation. Combine that with some of the anthropomorphized objects from the original that had cute little cartoon eyes just kind of stuck on top of them, being remade here to have more detailed, less blatantly cartoonish eyes with more defined eyelids that mesh into the geometry of the rest of the character in a kind of jarring way. A lot of these character designs lose a bit of the raw cartoonish charm of the N64 original and become something a fair bit more creepy. Another common presentational sacrifice on the original N64 due to its limited storage on its cartridges was the soundtrack. The songs in Conquer were all well composed and paid homage to swing that was reminiscent of classic cartoons like Looney Tunes that the game was clearly parodying early on, before shifting to rock and electronic tracks later as it starts parodying movies and other pieces of media and its set pieces. But they were all realized with synthetic instruments using the same sound font that Rare would use in its other titles on the system, like Banjo-Kazooie. Live and Reloaded remixes the entire soundtrack with live instruments, which goes a long way of closing the gap between the source material being referenced and what the actual tracks themselves sound like. The tracks tend to have a fair bit more texture and fullness to them, and some short loops from the original are expanded into longer compositions to help reduce the auditory monotony. While not a massive departure from the original, there were also some minor but important alterations to the gameplay as well. It seems like Rare realized in the couple years between the Xbox remake and the original that some of their design decisions confused challenge with tedium, and so when Live and Reloaded, a fair amount of that tedium was amended or outright removed, making the game easier, but for all the right reasons. The bullfight, for example, doesn't make each cow take increasingly more hits to trigger the next part of the fight. Sections in the It's War level that required annoying precision that stressed the already clunky controls were amended to be accomplished with standard weapons or removed entirely. 
Some of the collectibles were either relocated to be more streamlined to obtain, and when multiple items of the same type needed to be repeatedly collected in the same way, the amount of repetitions needed to complete that task were cut down, among a handful of other minor nips and tucks. Most importantly though, Live and Reloaded vastly amended the control scheme of the original game. While the beginning of Conquer is mostly a fetch quest with light platforming, the game quickly evolves into a third-person shooter by its second half. This was a difficult type of control scheme to accommodate on the N64's gamepad with just a single analog stick. Conquer also had no lock-on or aim assist, so a game that turned into a shooter had pretty poor shooting mechanics. Live and Reloaded retools the controls to be a more traditional dual analog setup that nearly all modern shooters have adapted, and the late game is all the better for it. Though, using your melee weapon still requires you pull out your weapon and move into a third-person, strafing, over-the-shoulder shooter control that makes more sense for a gun than a bat, which can be jarring on your first playthrough since you may not be aware the game is going to turn into a shooter on you later. The second analog stick also lets you have complete control over the camera at all times, vastly improving some of the trickier platforming, swimming, and flying segments, conforming them to modern control scheme expectations as well. All that being said though, at the end of the day, it still conquers bad fur day. It still has generally poor game feel, the now tired writing tropes, and pretty boring tasks to complete that amount to nearly an entire game of fetch quests and escort missions. Add to the fact that for some reason, Rare thought that they should censor the majority of curse words in a remake of a game that was marketed entirely on its crude humor, remade for a console specifically marketed towards older teenagers and adults, and you have a package that is probably the best way to experience this title, but still amounts to polishing a turd. And this game knows all about turds. In conclusion, I can see why there was so much chatter surrounding Conker's Bad Fur Day when it was first released. It definitely was unique and brought some interesting ideas and personality to the table. But when you strip away the mature themes of the game and get over the initial shock of it saying bad words, being irreverent, and featuring bouncy boobies, well, you're not left with much of a game. The game mechanics are sloppy. The writing has aged considerably. And any edgy charm or humor this game was trying to achieve does not, in my opinion, hold up to this day and is very much so a product of its time. That being said, I have an odd respect for Conker's Bad Fur Day, and I'm glad that it exists. I'll always appreciate the effort of people who try to do something different, even if they don't stick the landing. <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget Kid Me seeing an article about Conker in my friend's gaming magazine and thinking, whoa, this kind of stuff is allowed on the N64? Awesome! I want to play! Kid Me never got the chance, but adult me did. And yeah, Kid Me definitely had some high expectations. The Fool. Now, it can be argued that the landscape of adult gaming and media in general has changed drastically over the years, both in tone and availability. That playing Conquer nowadays just does not hit the same way it would have back in the early 2000s. During that time, adult gaming such as Conquer, where it looks like it's a kid's game, but it's instead loaded with crass jokes and sexual humor, was few and far between, and only enhanced the risque experience. Today though, there's such an overwhelming amount of adult games and content that the shock factor of something like Conquer just doesn't leave the same impression anymore and would be forgotten about relatively quickly. It was a novelty, a product of its time, with an interesting backstory, edgy cutscenes, and quirky voice acting. But at its core, it was a messy platformer that was frustrating to play. So if you want to play adult video games that are edgy and sexy and irreverent, I'd avoid this one and go look elsewhere. Like furry dating sims on Steam. Pray for me, boys. I'm going in. <laughs> Again.